In today's True Crime Tutorial Tuesday video, I'm talking about Suzanne Kappa whilst doing my makeup. So keep on watching to hear about her murder and see me create this makeup look. Suzanne Kappa was born in England in 1976. She never knew her biological father as he had walked out before Susan had been born. And her mother, Elizabeth Dunbar, had married a man named John Kappa. She had a sister named Michelle and a brother also named John. Michelle was fairly close to Suzanne from what I can gather from my research. In 1990, when Susan was only 14, her parents divorced and she spent time living in the system. She would also live between her mother's house, her stepfather's and couch surfing with friends. At the time the crime took place, Susan was living with her stepfather John and her sister Michelle at 6 Bewley Walk. Susan was very much an innocent girl who was described as just wanting someone to love her, who was constantly let down by those around her, even by her parents. She started to skip school and her teachers said her behaviour was erratic. Eventually Susan became friends with Jean Powell. Jean was a 26-year-old mother of three living in 97 Langworthy Road, Manchester, Moston, which is about a seven-minute walk to Susan's house. Jean was described as a powerful character who dominated those around her. Jean Powell's home was a centre for drug dealing, stolen cars, trading and sex parties, so her house was frequented by a lot of people who enjoyed getting into trouble. Suzanne's older sister, Michelle Capper, had also lived with Jean but had moved out after two months because of the criminal activities that went on around her house. Suzanne Kappa's stepfather, John, stated, I tried to stop Suzanne from going there, but she had a very strong will because even he had a bad feeling about that place. John has repeatedly referred to Jean Powell's house as a house of evil. Also living at 97 Langworthy Road was Bernadette McNeely, a 24-year-old who was also a mother of three. She'd originally been renting 21 Langworthy Road, but after becoming best friends with Jean Powell, decided to move in with her and her own three children. So at this point, you have the two mothers and six children in the house, and it was known as a place to get drugs and for stolen cars and their parts to change hands. Both women dealt drugs and had a very bad relationship with their neighbours, once setting a neighbour's washing on fire. Inside the house, there were just car seats placed around the house for people to sit on, and there were industrial kitchen scales in the kitchen for weighing out drugs. It was no place for children. It was here that Suzanne fell in with the wrong crowd. Glyn Powell, 29, was Jean's ex-husband who had convictions for burglary, theft and being drunk and disorderly. Anthony Dudson, 17, was Jean's on-again, off-again boyfriend. Geoffrey Lee, 26, had convictions for robbing his 86-year-old disabled aunt. Clifford Hayes, 18, was Jean's brother and Suzanne's ex-boyfriend. Suzanne continued to frequent the home despite the fact that almost everybody there bullied her and took advantage of her kind nature. It was not that she was scared of them, it's just she would do anything for them. She pampered her every whim, recalled her sister Michelle. In fact, in late 1992, Suzanne went to her mother's home after being beaten up by Jean. Her mother cruelly turned her away when Suzanne begged to be let in the house and allowed to stay overnight. Her mother said her boyfriend wouldn't allow it and Susan walked back to Jean's house. I believe that had she done something to help Susan, things might be very different today. As a parent myself, I would find what Susan's mother did very hard to live with, said Michelle's fiancé, Paul Barlow. Before Susan became involved with the group at Jean's house, she had no human companionship other than from her family. In this squalid house on Langworthy Road, Susan found a source of human contact and she found it difficult to break that friendship up despite the fact it was abusive. Jean would get Susan to skip school and go to work with her as a cleaner and would then take Susan's full pay packet, leaving her with only £5 a week. When Suzanne's mother, Elizabeth, found out about this, she confronted Jean, who threatened to burn down her house in retaliation. Suzanne apparently told a neighbour that Jean had held her for four days and beat her up, but from what I read, nobody seemed to believe her. Things would escalate on December the 7th. Over the week, the group, including Glyn Powell, Jean Powell, Bernadette McNeely and Anthony Dudson, all got pubic lice. They all had to shave their genitals and were annoyed by it. Jean decided that the only possible way that they could have gotten it was from Suzanne. 
and the bed they sometimes slept in, despite the fact that the group were all regularly having sex with each other. On top of that, a pink duffel coat costing around £50 had gone missing, and they went on to say that Susan had stolen it, despite drifters constantly being in and out of the house. And Jean was already annoyed by Susan, because Susan had suggested that Jean have sex with someone that Jean didn't want to have sex with. Jean then making some racist remark about them. So the group decided to exact their revenge on the 7th of December 1992. The two girls visited Susan's stepfather's home on Bewley Walk and told Susan that there was a guy she had a crush on waiting for her at 97 Langworthy Road. She willingly went with them. As soon as she set foot inside the house, Suzanne was grabbed by Glyn Powell and Anthony Dudson. They shaved off her hair and her eyebrows and made her clean up the hair and put it in the bin. A plastic bag was then put over her head and she was suffocated while they beat her with many different objects, including a three-foot wooden spoon, which I believe to be one of those decorative ones that people hang up on the walls in like the kitchen and that sort of thing. A bat was also used in the beatings. At this point, something happened to Suzanne's arm. I'm not exactly sure what, but it hung limp by her side and Suzanne lay on the floor in a fetal position while the girls took turns in kicking and beating her themselves. Bernadette then locked Suzanne in a cupboard for the night and she cried the whole night and so because the women were concerned that the children would get upset by her crying, they decided to move Suzanne to 91 Langworthy Road the next morning. In a back room, there was an upturned box spring mattress with exposed boards, which Suzanne was tied spread eagle to and half naked with electric wires and chains. They stuffed socks in Suzanne's mouth to prevent her from screaming and would regularly beat her. It's believed that Jean once spent two hours alone beating Susan. They also injected her with amphetamines and later, when this comes up in court, the perpetrator says she did this to save Suzanne from being injected with meth. The amphetamines would have not allowed her to sleep. She was burned with cigarettes and one burn mark was right between her eyes. Her two front teeth were pulled out with pliers and another was snapped in half, leaving the nerve exposed. The teeth were later recovered. They had kept them as a trophy. The pliers were also found on a shelf near the Christmas tree. Through all the torture and abuse, Suzanne was subject to a tape of Chucky repeating I'm Chucky, wanna play? through headphones, as well as rave music at maximum volume. <laughs> Jean's brother Clifford and addict Jeffrey Lee would call into the house and they would also partake in Suzanne's torture. Eventually the group decided that Suzanne needed a bath, particularly Clifford and Jeffrey, as at this point she'd been lining her own excrement and urine for days. They put her in the bath and dumped bleach and disinfectant over her and scrubbed her with a yard brush, which resulted in some of Suzanne's skin being removed. Like you'd think that would be the worst part of this case, but sadly it's not. Over the course of seven days, there were plenty of opportunities for Susan to be saved. At one point, Jeffrey Lee and Anthony Dudson even went to visit Paul Barlow, Michelle's fiance, and Susan's soon-to-be brother-in-law, to get one of their cars fixed. Then a 19-year-old named David Hill was asked to sit in at the house while the others went out for a bit, likely to make sure Susan did not escape. He didn't realise at first what was happening until he heard Anthony shout, Shut up, you slag. And when David asked about it, Anthony showed him Susan tied to the bed. He said she had a sort of cloth over her face, just from above the eyebrows, covering up her nose. She had a bit of dry blood on her lip and she had no hair. He also said that he heard them speaking about dentistry work. It was something about pulling her teeth out of a pair of pliers. She asked me if I could help, but I told her I couldn't. I asked her who she was. She said her name was Susan and she asked me if I could untie her. I said I couldn't do anything. I thought they would batter me if I said anything. 
they'd always got me, wouldn't they? I didn't know what to do. I was too shocked to do anything. So again, Susan was let down by those around her. Now, John Capper was starting to worry about his stepdaughter. He hadn't seen her for a week, and while it wasn't uncommon for him not to see her for a few days, it was never really this long. He was going to report her as a missing person. The group heard about this from Michelle, who had been asking around for her sister, and they decided that this meant it was time for them to get rid of Susan. In the early evening hours of December the 14th, 1992, the gang decided it was time to move Susan out of the house. They decided to drive her out to the remote woodland area near Stockport. They pulled her out of the car and rolled her body down an embankment. She suffered multiple cuts from branches and thorns on her way down. Susan had already endured pain and treatment that no individual should ha ever have to. However, it was about to get even worse. Once at the bottom of the embankment, Bernadette poured petrol over Susan's entire body. They then set Susan on fire. Susan's body went up in flames immediately. The gang all thought she would die and instantly left the scene, laughing and singing, burn baby burn. However, Susan didn't die at the bottom of that embankment, incredibly. Susan had somehow managed to drag herself up the embankment after the gang had left her there to die. She staggered onto the road and was found by a man on his way to work. The man quickly alerted the authorities and medics were quick to come to Susan's aid. However, Susan had suffered burns on over 80% of her body and suffered severe internal damage. Her burns were so bad that she had to be identified by a partial print on her thumb, the only print that they could get due to her extensive burns. Her own parents wouldn't even recognise her. She was able to give the names of the people who had done this to her and Jean's address before either being put into a medically induced coma or slipping into one herself. Suzanne unfortunately died from multi-organ failure due to her injuries on the 18th of December 1992. On the same day as Susan's attempted murder, police were sent to arrest everyone they found at 97 Langworthy Road. Anthony Dudson broke first. His own father urged him to tell the truth and the more he spoke, the worse it got. Policemen cried when they heard the full extent of Susan's torture. The group, obviously, as they are becoming sober while in custody, are realising that they are in deep shit and are trying to place the blame on each other. And so it took some time to get the full picture of what happened to Suzanne. The trial began nearly a year later in November of 1993 and it lasted 22 days. All of them distanced themselves from the final act of horror of the burning of Suzanne. According to Jean, she sat in the car whilst the others set Suzanne alight. I was numb, I was scared, she alleged. How do you think Suzanne was feeling then? She also claimed that she had locked Suzanne in a cupboard for her own safety and that she loved her as a sister, adding that she can't stand violence, I can't even smack my own children. Benedict claimed she had held the canister of petrol but said that Anthony had grabbed it from her moments before Susan went up in flames. Anthony told the court that Glynn had been the one to set Suzanne on fire. During the sentencing phase, Judge Francis Potts called the murder as appalling a murder as it is possible to imagine. He sentenced Jean Powell, Bernadette McNeely and Glyn Powell to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. Jeffrey Lee was sentenced to 12 years. Anthony Dudson was detained indefinitely with a minimum tariff of 18 years. Clifford Hayes was sentenced to 15 years. Jeffrey was released early in 1998 on licence. Clifford was released on licence in May 2001, while Bernadette was incarcerated at H M Prison Durham. A security check in 1996 uncovered letters which revealed she had been having an affair with the prison governor, Mike Martin. The married officer resigned his position before disciplinary action could be taken. It it's also believed that she may have had an affair with Rose West, which she was sharing a prison wing with, along with Myra Hindley and Karen Matthews. Bernadette was freed in 2015 after 21 years behind bars. She was also given a new identity and she stayed in touch with Karen Matthews and moved to the same area when she was freed, which was given the nickname Monster Mansion. Jean Powell is now Jean Glipsy after her divorce finalised while in prison. However, the case had a lasting effect on England and between the case and the murder of James Bulger that had happened within the same time frame, the release of movies were pushed back including Natural Born Killers and Reservoir Dogs for a few months in the UK. Also, as the case had made the link between the murders and the Child's Play song, which was made by the news media. Suzanne was an incredibly brave girl who didn't deserve the horrific abuse and treatment that she suffered in her last week of her short 16 years of existence. That's everything for today's video, everything I've got on today's case. I hope you guys have all enjoyed and I'll see you all in the next one.